tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So for the moment, um, we are uh, going to obviously make adjustments. Shipments stopped. Why BC won't be getting any Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine next week also. But when you actually see the stats, it's remarkable. Like, wow, it works. How measures to fight COVID-19 have left BC without a single case of the seasonal flu and Every other school district is offering more than double what the VSB kids are getting. Why many parents are giving the Vancouver School Board a failing grade. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. BC was expecting to receive fewer doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine next week as the manufacturer scales back delivery in light of production upgrades. But now our health minister says we won't be getting any. Dan Burrow joins us now live with more on this. So Dan, what's the upshot? Mike, it's a ripple effect across the country. Earlier today, the federal government announced that Canada's shipment of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine will be cut to just a fifth of what was expected. And next week, we get none BC Health Minister Adrian Dix says they were expecting to receive about 5,800 doses of the vaccine, so now they will have to make use of the small stock we still have. We'll have to devote more of the Pfizer that we have, that we're getting this week, and more of the, uh, the Pfizer that we have on hand, which is only a small amount of it, um, to uh, two things, essentially all to finishing up uh, uh, long-term care homes that haven't been fully done uh, across the province, and, and the other is second doses. Now, Dick says those second doses will begin tomorrow, 35 days from the first doses being given in hospitals in Fraser Health and Coastal Health. He says despite the loss of the almost 6,000 doses next week, we are expecting to get about 25,000 doses a week after that. Right now, the province has administered just over 92,000 doses of vaccine. Dick says they hope this is a one-time interruption. He was asked if BC may try to get vaccines outside the supply chain set up by Ottawa. He says, unlikely. Mike. All right, Dan, thanks very much. In the meantime, Canada isn't expecting any of the Moderna vaccine until next month. It's causing concerns for health officials across the country. As David Cochran explains, the federal government is trying to ease concerns by emphasizing it's only temporary. Canada won't receive a single dose from Pfizer during the week of January 25th. That follows an 18% reduction this week and smaller than expected shipments to come in early February. So about half of what we had originally expected. Uh, but those numbers remain to be confirmed by uh, Pfizer Canada. Those reductions, the result of work to expand production at this Pfizer plant in Belgium. Several European countries have also been hit with delays. I spent the weekend on the phone with Pfizer executives and my team. We reiterated firmly the importance for Canada to return to our regular delivery schedule as soon as possible. I'd be on that phone call every single day. I'd be up that guy's yin yang so far with a firecracker, he wouldn't know what hit him from Pfizer. I would, would not stop until we get these vaccines. The assurance from Pfizer is that Canada will get back on track when the Belgium plant gets back online. And these doses are merely delayed, not cancelled. The total number of doses committed to us is still the same, with every Canadian who wants to get vaccinated able to get vaccinated by September. But the supply interruption is a significant disruption in the short term. The shortfall amounts to about 570,000 fewer doses over the next four weeks. And that will force health authorities to cancel or delay the vaccination appointments of frontline workers and vulnerable Canadians. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. To the latest numbers now, and sadly, another 12 people have died from COVID-19 in B.C. Our province's death toll now sits at 1,090. 465 more positive cases have been confirmed since yesterday's update. Total cases in our province now approaching 62,000. 329 people are in hospital tonight recovering from the virus, 70 of those patients in critical or intensive care. Just over 4,300 people currently have COVID-19 in B.C., and just under 6,900 people are under active public health monitoring. 
And as Dan mentioned, just over 92,000 people have received the first dose of the COVID vaccine. An angry group of parents is lashing out at the Vancouver School Board tonight. They say the VSB has failed to give their high school age children enough in-person instruction, whether it be in class or online. As Bell Puri of the CBC Impact Team reports, the parents claim the VSB is breaking the law. Vancouver's COVID back to school plan implemented in September is getting a failing grade. My child has gone from an outgoing, joyous, happy 13 year old to a sullen, depressed, anxious, socially isolated, vulnerable teen. Parents of high school students across the district are upset. For my daughter, she's in eighth grade. There's certainly an impact to her education. The reason why? The VSB is only providing 105 minutes of instruction per day. That is it. That's one third of the teaching hours required by BC School Act. They claim to provide remote instruction, but they do not require teachers to provide any actual instruction during the remote block. Neighboring school districts provide double or even triple the VSB's teacher time. Vancouver grades 8 through 12 get 8.75 hours a week of in-person instruction. In Burnaby, North Vancouver and Surrey, grades 8 and 9 are in class full time. And the senior grades get a mix of in-person and remote instruction for approximately 18 hours in Burnaby and North Van and 22 hours in Surrey. The problem is going to be whenever these kids get compared to other children who have had the privilege of being in school full time. In all of the surrounding districts around Vancouver, how will these kids be prepared for universities? BC's education minister shares the parents' concerns and has met with the VSB. Jennifer Whiteside says she expects Vancouver to adhere to laws and come up with a way to deliver appropriate instruction. Parents believe a fear of COVID transmission is behind the VSB strategy. I'm not telling them to go and put children back in classrooms 5.5 hours a day. They could put children back in class in person more. They also could require schools and teachers to provide real remote instruction, live streamed videos, um, actual lessons with a teacher present. The Vancouver School Board maintains its plan was approved by the Ministry of Education. That said, right now it's evaluating the system to see if it needs improvement. The board says it has talked to students, their families and staff and looked at student attendance and achievement. The outcome of the assessment will determine what happens next. Parents aren't happy to wait. They say their children need more access to education now and want an immediate solution. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, back in March, when the pandemic began, you may recall pots were banged, horns honked outside hospitals and elsewhere across BC at 7 o'clock in the evening to show support for healthcare workers. Over time, those nightly cheers stopped or slowed down. But in Prince George, the beat goes on. A group of Indigenous drummers continues to cheer on patients and healthcare workers every Monday night at the University Hospital of Northern BC. Many members of the group know someone who's been affected by COVID-19 or is working on the front lines at the hospital. The group says it's about showing support for the community during this tough time. They plan to keep drumming every Monday until the pandemic is over. With the intense focus on stopping the spread of COVID-19, the fight against the flu is getting a break this year. The BC Centre for Disease Control says it hasn't found a single case of seasonal flu spreading in the community this winter. As Megan Bachelor reports, it's a phenomenon that's being noted worldwide. As a teacher, I get sick a lot too. Like I've gotten so many different things over the years, um, not just colds, but you know, strep throat and um, I had pink eye one year. This school year though, Jessica Deacher hasn't had to call in sick once. This year has been, been much healthier, I would say, just in terms of like the flu and colds and stuff like that. No, okay. She's not the only one noticing how less socialization, wearing masks and the constant hand washing is making a difference when it comes to the seasonal flu. Doctors are also crediting an uptick in the seasonal flu vaccine. Being inside a lot, uh, 
has its downsides, but I guess these are the upsides. And the evidence backs up what people are experiencing. The BC Center of Disease Control says that it did around 30,000 tests on samples for influenza so far this flu season and only came up with around a dozen positive cases. Compare that to the flu season of 2019-2020. There were 861 positive tests and around one third of the testing done. We've tested more than four times as many specimens in September this year as we have in typically uh, on average in the past five seasons. So we are, we are trying to find that virus, but so far uh, nothing. And that has translated into having the resources and capacity for doctors to better focus on COVID-19. Can you imagine with all the stressors that we have with COVID-19, in our hospitals, if we had to add influenza to that, it would be disastrous. I mean, we would have buckled long ago. It's made a difference in long-term care homes too. There were 19 seasonal flu outbreaks in the facilities last year. This flu season, zero. Dr. Jawanda hopes that some of the pandemic practices that are now social norms will continue into a post-pandemic flu season. We obviously uh, talk about being washing your hands and not you know coughing into your uh, sleeve like we tell all our kids but when you actually see the stats it's remarkable like wow it works and will hopefully make a difference in flu seasons to come megan bachelor cbc news vancouver some passengers on a saturday flight from vancouver to nanaimo are venting their frustrations tonight after they say the plane filled mostly with international students let out into the terminal with little regard for physical distancing. It just didn't feel safe. It didn't feel right. It didn't feel acceptable. There's no social distancing. So like all the government uh, advisories kind of just went out the window. I mean, I'm concerned that I could have got it. Nearly 80 passengers emptied into the Nanaimo airport terminal, many then joined by those who came to pick them up, despite signs telling non-passengers to stay outside. Air Canada says all the international passengers had to test negative for COVID-19 before boarding. The Nanaimo Airport says it will conduct a review to ensure safety protocols are followed in the future. Of course, anyone arriving from outside BC is required to quarantine for two weeks. The number of children and youth involuntarily admitted for mental health treatment in BC has jumped an alarming 162%. The new report looked at how the province uses its power under the Mental Health Act to admit young people into treatment. The representative for children and youth is calling for changes to improve the process of forced detentions. In 2018, more than 2,500 youth were involuntarily admitted. That's up from 973 10 years earlier. We must have in place in this province a comprehensive system of culturally appropriate and youth-specific voluntary community services so that involuntary detention is only used as a measure of last resort. The report found young people are often unaware of their rights when being detained, and many reported feeling like they had no say in their own mental health treatment. Charles Worth laid out 14 recommendations for the province to consider. Some residents of Old Fort near Fort St. John have filed a lawsuit after two landslides all but wiped out their property values. Landslides last year and in 2018 cut off the only road in and out of the rural community. A lawyer representing the 35 residents says the case is about the ongoing loss of land stability and road access. The suit alleges the province hasn't tried to determine the cause of the slides while still issuing development permits. Several homes in the area are still on evacuation alert. Well, it was an unusual wake-up call for police and the Coast Guard early this morning. They found themselves in hot pursuit of a water taxi after one was stolen from Victoria Harbour Ferry. We followed him up to about the Empress uh, and he was honking the horn and flashing the lights and, and you know just spinning around in circles. Yeah, this happened at about three o'clock in the morning. Victoria police uh, don't have a marine unit so responding officers boarded a boat and gave chase. They also called in the Coast Guard. The suspect did eventually surrender and was arrested. He now faces charges, recommended charges of theft over $5,000. Kelowna Mounties have wrapped up an international drug investigation after 21 bricks of cocaine were found hidden in two shipments of bananas. 
Two separate grocery stores reported the unusual findings to police in February of last year, or sorry, February of 2019. RCMP say the illicit drugs originated in Colombia but likely ended up in the central Okanagan after a missed pickup somewhere along the route. It's estimated 800,000 doses of crack cocaine could have been created using the bricks. Our first check of the forecast now with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Another nice day on the south coast, but uh, change is looming. Yes, change is looming. I think we've all seen the snow icon as we head into the weekend. <laughs> that is the elephant in the forecast, and I will not ignore it. But we had some big weather today across the province. I actually want to take you to pictures out of Prince George first, where uh, we had a front roll through knocking down trees. Look at that. A, a tree snapped, which often shows you that the winds were very strong rather than uprooted. 91 kilometer per hour winds uh, reported at the airport around 2 p.m. That's as a front came through, very strong pressure gradient. So the winds were coming from the south and then shifted dramatically to come in from the west. About 9,000 customers uh, at the peak without power. We're still seeing gusts tonight up around 40, 50 kilometers per hour. That main front is actually tracking off into Alberta. The bottom end of it, is actually moving through our neck of the woods. Not nearly as strong, though. Uh, the wind warnings have ended for BC, but you can see they're in place east of the Rockies, expected to see 100 km per hour wind gusts uh, with a bit of a, a schnook impact on the east side there. Something else that I wanted to show you, this is not Mordor. This is the shadow of Mount Baker uh, this morning on the clouds above. I, some amazing pictures uh, being shared on social media. This is from our own uh, Tanya Fletcher. So very cool and very unique conditions. And yes, you may have noted the red sky in the morning, uh, sailors warning. Not a huge system I'm watching right now, but look as I take you through uh, the model rainfall. Just a few showers on tap overnight, really scattered and isolated, and most of it, again, will be occurring through the overnight. Uh, looking at a mainly dry Wednesday ahead, uh, mainly overcast as well, keeping the clouds in the forecast right through Wednesday, but again, mainly dry, mainly dry and cloudy through Thursday as well. We're getting closer to the uh, part of the week where I will talk about the snow, but I'll save that for later on in the show, Mike. All right. We can wait for that. Thanks, Joe. Talk to you again in a bit. And the long winter nights are staying a little bit brighter this year. BC Hydro is reporting more people are indeed leaving their Christmas lights up. A new survey conducted by Hydro has found that about 40% of customers decided to leave up Christmas lights or even leave them on longer. Vancouver Islanders being the most likely to stay lit. Those who responded said they want to brighten up the COVID-19 winter. They acknowledge spending more time at home is a reason to keep them up longer this year. A lot of young hockey players across Canada say they're feeling left out. Although the NHL season is underway, hockey is still off the ice for most Canadians. As Cameron McIntosh reports, they're now worried COVID might cost them their shot. Here's Kagan near side, moves in, fires, score! Josh Kagan was hoping for another season of this. Kagan with a goal forehand! Trying to get noticed in the Junior A British Columbia Hockey League. How's practice? Uh, it's okay. It's going more like this. Video calls with his parents in Winnipeg. A lot of missing the net. Definitely a little out of shape. Trying to keep his spirits up as COVID keeps his league off the ice. How stressful is this for your family? Like when you guys talk? It's been really hard. Uh, it's, uh, you're trying to read between the tea, tea leaves all the time? Because you got a kid that's 2,000 miles away who's not going to tell you honestly how he feels, but you can sort of hear it in his voice. It's extremely frustrating. I mean, it's, uh, it's mentally very difficult to grasp. As a 20-year-old in his final year of junior hockey, he's missing his last shot at a scholarship. It's something I've worked for for 16 years, and it's all kind of uh, led up to this point. Not everyone is playing for those stakes, but there are concerns down to the youngest levels of hockey. A Hockey Canada survey found 45% of parents worried about their kids' mental health. Having that identity kind of taken away can really be a struggle. Sports psychologist Melanie Gregg says even for recreational athletes, missing time in a sport can be isolating. I think it's really important to keep that in mind that everyone's in the same situation as far as lacking those sport opportunities, those competitive opportunities this year. Goalie Jordan Naylor is another junior player grappling with the notion this could be it. So it's what I go to bed thinking about, it's what I wake up thinking about, it's, it's very stressful. The Kagans are pushing Hockey Canada to extend eligibility to make sure no last chances are lost.
Well, everybody that controls the situation is saying, well, we hope things will get better. At some point, you got to leave hope aside and come up with a plan. Hockey Canada hasn't responded to that, but is urging hockey leagues across the country to do what they can to keep players engaged. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Quick reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Slow to respond. The WHO is pointing fingers at governments for failing to take action as the pandemic ramped up last year. Why so many failed on so many levels, next. And yeah, thanks for being with us online during the television commercial break. Well, whether it's job losses or the stress of uncertainty, we're all handling this ongoing pandemic in our own way. But when it comes to resilience and focusing on the positives, Ryan Strashnitsky has more experience than any 21-year-old should have. He was paralyzed in the 2018 Humboldt Broncos bus crash. CBC Edmonton host Nancy Carlson spoke with him about his determination. It kind of goes way back. I mean, growing up playing hockey and, and you know, even life events, you know, things are going to happen. Roadblocks are going to happen. And um, I think if, um, you know, if you're, you're if you're anyone that wants to succeed, you know, you're going to find a way around that roadblock. And uh, I think for me, uh, this past three years have just been, you know, a whirlwind and it's, it's all learning experience. And, you know, I kind of take into consideration that, you know, I'm not the only one going through it. So, uh, there's people who have it have it a lot worse. How do you maintain your resilience? How have you maintained it through everything that you've gone through? And then to throw a pandemic on top of it, have you been able to kind of apply your previous resilience to kind of what we're going through now? There's going to be bad days and there's going to be good days. So for me, it's it's like that inner voice, right? It's it's you know, okay, what do you have to do today? Uh, it's just something as simple as getting up, right? Sit up, um, you know get off your phone, uh, take a deep breath in and just, you know, appreciate what you have. Right. So it's, it's little things like that. It doesn't have to be, you know, tremendous things like, Oh, I got to go for a, you know, hour long run or whatever the case. I mean, it's just as simple as getting out of bed. So yeah, I mean, you start with that and, and you use those as building blocks to, you know, face those inner demons. Where does that motivation come from? Where do you turn to for that? It, it's all over. I mean, you can find motivation in almost everything, but for me, it, it there's so many things that tie into it. I mean, obviously I want to, do the best and remember my teammates as best as possible. And that's what keeps me going every day because uh, you never know when your last day is going to be. So for me personally, I love helping people. I love, um, you know, talking to them, trying to get them through whatever they're going through. So, um, you know, not everyone's going to be on board, but it's just about working with them. And I think, uh, again, going through hockey and, and a bunch of good leaders I played with, that was, that was one of their goals is to make everyone around them better. Is there a piece of advice that you have for people? Um, it's it's tough. I mean, there's so many things you can talk about, but for me, I think it's just about um, taking that next step, uh, no matter what the case is. I mean, uh, I know a lot of people feel alone at, uh, in these times, so I think it's important to reach out to friends and family. And I think if you're if you know that you're not alone and you're able to to talk to people and and get stuff sorted out in that sense, then I think um, you know you'll be a lot happier and uh, you'll feel a weight lifted off your shoulders. So. And another humble Bronco alum is also sharing his story. Caleb Dahlgren is releasing a book in March. It's called Crossroads. Dahlgren, along with Streshnitsky, were among the 13 people who survived the April 2018 bus crash. 16 others were killed. Portions of the book's sales will go to Stars Air Ambulance, who were first responders at the crash. Crossroads will hit the bookshelves on March 16. All right, back in just a couple of seconds, more news from across the country and around the world. A group of experts is pointing fingers tonight at both China and the World Health Organization for their response to the pandemic. A review was set up to investigate global reaction to COVID-19. And as Christine Birak explains, the interim report says reaction to the initial outbreak was too slow. Every day there's a new and grim milestone in this pandemic. Experts say this is the result of a series of global failures. We are not here to assign blame. And yet there's plenty to go around. 
An interim report written by an expert panel commissioned by the World Health Organization says we have failed in our collective capacity to come together to protect human security and the authors are pushing for real change. To make concrete recommendations that will help the world to respond faster and better in the future. Experts acknowledge China and the World Health Organization were slow to issue warnings, but countries around the world, including Canada, didn't act fast enough, even when they came. We are, of course, uh, looking very carefully at this interim report and seeing uh, how we can uh, apply those lessons, not just for uh, future challenges, but right now to Canada's pandemic response. Every political leader in the world was just hoping that the next pandemic wouldn't happen on their watch. The results, deadly consequences. Global health experts insist there are no new lessons to be learned. Detect public health problems early, sound the proper alarms, and respond as quickly as possible. To do that, politicians must fund public health programs. Instead, they've been cutting them for years. I think COVID-19 will last a long time in people's minds. And ideally, that will be a bit of a, a rallying cry around the kind of systems that we want to have in place. Obviously, uh, there are things looking back that uh, we could have, uh, should have done differently. And I think one of the most important things as we move forward is making sure that we learn from this experience uh, for future governments and future administrations. Too little, too late for so many Canadians. But experts warn this won't be the last pandemic. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Montreal is prioritizing more than 500 COVID-19 vaccines for members of the city's homeless population. A vaccination clinic was held today in a city drop-in center. As Alice Northcott reports, advocates say it's a crucial first step to protect a group of people who are particularly vulnerable to the virus. In Montreal's old port, this space has been transformed into a drop-in centre for people experiencing homelessness. And today, it's where some got their first dose of the vaccine. They're among the most vulnerable people in society. That is a good enough reason. Mark Paquette says he's been worried about catching the virus. Because I'm homeless and the fact that uh, um, other people may have it and you don't even know about it. So getting that first dose was reassuring. Montreal has prioritized about 500 doses for people who are homeless and some shelter staff after a number of outbreaks. They move around, so they're mobile. They don't have any place where they can go and self-isolate. Sam Watts runs a downtown shelter and says the pandemic adds a layer of complexity to homelessness. He says the recent case of Rafael Andre, a homeless man found dead in a portable toilet, underscores the system's failures. In Toronto, there's a similar pilot project, beginning with vaccinations for about 80 people at a shelter. The risk of complications is high. Dr. Stephen Huang says that's in part because of the number of seniors in the shelter system. We also know that uh, people who are homeless uh, have a very a much higher rate of uh, chronic health conditions like heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, and uh, other conditions that put them at high risk. He says there will be challenges like bringing people back for the second dose and overcoming the mistrust some have in the healthcare system. Tanya Martin has been using a shelter in Montreal and got her shot yesterday. It's good because we're basically 35 women cramped into one house, so we're all close proximities. It's good that um, we're getting vaccinated and it, it's positive to me. Um, I, I'm hopeful about it. Montreal's plan only covers a fraction of the city's homeless population, but advocates hope it's just a start. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. The Prime Minister says he is making the case for the Keystone XL project to the highest levels of the U.S. government. There are reports incoming President Joe Biden plans to cancel the U.S. permit for the project as one of his first acts in office. Trudeau was asked about that today. I have been very clear over the past seven years uh, that I support uh, the Keystone XL project. Uh, we have uh, made that case, uh, including in front of a room filled with Democrats seven years ago uh, in Washington, D.C., before I became prime minister. Uh, we have highlighted, uh, including in a direct conversation I had with uh, President-elect uh, Biden uh, a number of weeks ago, 
that Canada has, uh, in the intervening uh, few years, become uh, a global leader on the fight against climate change and uh, moving forward on, on, uh, on transforming uh, our economy in positive ways to reduce carbon emissions, uh, and that uh, Keystone XL continues to be an important project for us. Prime Minister also said he would be speaking to Alberta Premier Jason Kenney today. Just coming up on 6.30, 9.30 Eastern Time, a live look at the White House tonight where Donald Trump's presidency is down to its final hours now. For many Americans, Joe Biden represents a return to stability. But tens of millions of Trump supporters will miss his blunt speech and renegade approach. Katie Simpson looks at what was a relatively understated final day from the outgoing president. Thousands of troops patrolling the Capitol during the final hours of Donald Trump's presidency. Images that will shape his legacy, marking the end of one of the most tumultuous terms in U.S. history. Trump spent his last days in office hidden from the public. Reportedly bitter, his efforts to hold on to power did not work. Lamenting his departure in a new video produced and recorded by his staff. Now, as I prepare to hand power over to a new administration at noon on Wednesday, I want you to know that the movement we started is only just beginning. Trump did not mention Joe Biden by name, nor did he admit his claims of widespread voter fraud are untrue, despite pleas to do so by members of his own party. I do believe that it's important for us, as Republicans in particular, to point out that the big lie is simply that, a lie. Senators will determine Trump's political future as they prepare to serve as jurors at his impending impeachment trial. Once powerful allies appear to be severing ties in light of the deadly Capitol riot. The mob was fed lies. They were provoked by the president and other powerful people. There are fears there may be lingering sympathy for that mob among members of the National Guard working inauguration. A dozen soldiers have already been sent home, at least two of them, for allegedly making inappropriate, possibly even extremist statements. With respect to comments about extremism, let me be clear. Extremism is not tolerated in any branch of the United States military. All Americans were horrified by the assault on our capital. Trump used his farewell address to condemn political violence, but expressed no remorse for any role he may have played. As I conclude my term as the 45th President of the United States, I stand before you truly proud of what we have achieved together. The White House has planned a military-style send-off. The president will speak at Joint Base Andrews. There'll be a military band. There'll be troops at a red carpet departure. What might stand out most about tomorrow, though, is who is not in attendance. High-profile former aides have declined invitations, as has the vice president. Mike Pence is reportedly furious with Trump about the riot and some high-profile public criticism. His schedule says he'll be attending Joe Biden's inauguration tomorrow instead. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. They are Canadians in the South, and they're getting COVID-19 vaccines. But many Americans aren't too happy about it. We'll have the backlash next. It's a pretty classy hotel, but it's pretty messy at the moment. Well, we're six days in countdown to opening. Uh, we're putting on all the little finishing touches uh, here at the Pan Pacific. This is the, um, what, the main lobby we're standing in? We're standing in the main lobby. Uh, we have a beautiful water feature that uh, is uh, prevalent when you uh, come up the Grand uh, Escalator, and that uh, translates into the beautiful 30-foot-high uh, uh, glass uh, windows that overlook Vancouver's beautiful harbor and the North Shore Mountains. So it's a very spectacular uh, grand entrance as you come into the property. Now, tell me about the uh, price of rooms. How much is it going to be? Regular rates. Well, the regular rates will start at $130, and they'll go to $200. And uh, this is a uh, comparable rate in, in the city of Vancouver for the service 
and the quality of a hotel. What about the uh, more expensive uh, suites? Well, we've got a lot of exciting suites, 39 in total. Uh, they range from $380 to $1,000 a night. This is part of the thousand dollars. It's called the Pacific Suite, and we're sitting uh, relaxing in the sauna with a great view. It's a, it's a wonderful view. Fortunately, the heat is not on. Um, what else does this suite offer? We have a uh, shower stall that has five shower heads and a steam uh, head, so you can get about, I think, uh, eight or nine people in there. I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> and a beautiful uh, um, jacuzzi tub, which you can sit back and watch the seagulls go by and watch Stanley Park and the runners going around Brockton Oval, etc. Now, the only thing I'm wondering about is we're sitting here, we can see out. Can people see in? No, it's, it's, it's a one-way type of situation, so uh, you can feel very comfortable relaxing um, in the sauna or in the uh, jacuzzi. If you take all of the beads put together and all the chandeliers in the meeting rooms, it comes to 3.8 million, and uh, the strands are 197,783, and if you stretch it from end to end, it will go from here to Squamish. What kind of food are you serving in this restaurant? It is on a basic, a traditional cooking, but prepare uh, like a nouvelle cuisine. You're cooking today. Why are you cooking before the opening? For training. We cook just for uh, the staff. Well, I've just had a spinach salad as an appetizer, and it was quite good. How was the service? It's good so far. What do you do here? I am a server in this very room, the Cafe Pacifica. How come you're not serving? I serve breakfast. We're being treated to lunch right now. Any reservations yet? We've been so busy with reservations in the last five days, uh, we can't keep our reservation lines open. Uh, there, we made approximately 1,500 reservations in the last five days. And uh, we've already uh, almost sold out for our first night. So it's very exciting, and we've got such a high spirit and a high attitude that we're just welcoming uh, or waiting to welcome the world. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Next week, we were expecting only six trays, or about 5,800 doses of Pfizer, so we won't be receiving that. BC's health minister says the province will be adjusting its COVID-19 vaccination plans. This after word that Pfizer won't be sending any doses to Canada next week. More than 92,000 people in BC have already received the first dose of the vaccine. So yeah, this year has been, been much healthier, I would say, just in terms of like the flu and colds and stuff like that. With the intense focus on stopping the spread of COVID-19, the fight against the flu is getting a break this year. The BC Center for Disease Control says it hasn't found a single case of seasonal flu spreading in the community this winter. The VSB is only providing 105 minutes of instruction per day. That is it. An angry group of parents is lashing out at the Vancouver School Board. They say the VSB has failed to give their high school age children enough in-person instruction, whether it be in class or online. They say other districts are providing more than double the time compared to Vancouver. Now to an update on a story CBC News broke earlier this month about how some Canadian snowbirds are getting the COVID vaccine faster than here at home and faster than some local Florida residents. As Diane Buckner tells us, the backlash is even making national news in the U.S. Good morning, America, breaking overnight. People across America, even from Canada and Argentina, flocking to Florida. It's been headline news in the U.S., growing anger over non-residents, like Canadian snowbirds, getting the vaccine in Florida, where anyone over age 65 is eligible. Floridians should be first. We've been married almost 40 years, and I haven't been in this for 40 years to lose him now to somebody from out of state that took his vaccine. There are even reports of Canadians jetting down for a short stay just to get the vaccine. I think that's for the few and, and uh, select group that could A, afford it, and B, would be able to make it happen. What in God's name is wrong with people? But this Canadian has lived in the States for 25 years. She's outraged that people from her home country are traveling at all. It just, it just seems morally wrong. I mean, there's so little vaccine. 
so little at this point. Some officials are upset too. Today, I presented a resolution to the city commission to prevent non-residents of the city of Miami from receiving vaccines prior to the elderly and vulnerable population of our community. Andrew Patton and his wife Jill of Toronto spent half the year at their winter home in Palm City. They got the shot last week. My friends, my American friends, are absolutely ecstatic that, that we're getting it because then we're going to protect them as well as ourselves. Shelton Pappel of Brantford, Ontario, is scheduled for his shot in Florida next week. He thinks the backlash will blow over quickly. I think as things go along, the more and more people get vaccinated, I think that becomes a duller story. Florida's governor says tourism is critical for its economy, and that's why extra doses of the COVID vaccine have been requested for seasonal residents. But until those doses arrive, the controversy and the complaints could get louder. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, let's just say he is super passionate about the weather. Coming up, Johanna Wagstaff profiles an amateur weather fan from the interior. And at 20 to 7, a live look at downtown Vancouver tonight. Reports, all eyes on the weather situation in the coming days. Is there snow in the picture? Johanna has her professional opinion next.
The Market Report is brought to you by Fortis BC. We've got even bigger rebates. Rebate. Whoa. On select high-efficiency equipment for business, but only for a limited time. I think it's fair to say the celestial display known as the Northern Lights is hard to beat, no matter how many times you see it. This breathtaking view was captured by a local photographer in Finland. The frigid weather didn't deter his quest to catch this magnificent dance of light, the hues of green made by solar particles colliding with gases high up in the atmosphere. It never gets tired. And while we enjoy a couple of really nice days here on the South Coast, a couple of Calgary residents finally got to leave their home for a stroll. Yes, the weather finally cooperated, and these king penguins were out for their royal waddle today. It's the ninth consecutive year these birds have taken to the pathways at the Calgary Zoo. Their daily walk is for the penguins' health and overall well-being. Because of the pandemic, Calgarians needed to purchase advance timed ticketing, and they're not allowed to move around during the penguins' 15-minute walk. <laughs> Never gets flightless waterfowl out for a stroll. It's good to get exercise, Joe. During the pandemic, you got to get out of the house. Walk around. Yes, you know what? Follow their lead. Yes, stretch those arms out, uh, head held high. That's the way to do it, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a pretty good forecast for walking the next couple of days, no matter how you do it, before we get to that snow forecast. Uh, let me start you off, though, with the current temperatures across the country. We've been waiting for penguin-esque temperatures for quite a few months now. Uh, we are halfway through meteorological winter, which runs from December through to March, and we have yet to see those minus double digits across B.C. Look where they're showing up, though. Northern B.C., northern Ontario, and in through parts of uh, Labrador and northern Quebec, we're starting to see that Arctic air descend. Now that it's sort of broken free from the north, uh, we are going to watch it filter down across the province for the later half of the week. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. Six right now at YVR, seven uh, out towards Hope our dissipating front, just bringing us a few scattered showers overnight. We actually get a bit of a high pressure building in the forecast for your Wednesday. Uh, it's mainly anchored in through the central interior, so just a cloudy but mainly dry Wednesday and Thursday, as I mentioned earlier. Watch the specific system, though, moving in from the west. It's just going to skim south of us at this point for Thursday, may maybe clipping us with a few showers. As we head into Friday, that's when the Arctic air will descend. So still above seasonal for most of BC tomorrow. You can see uh, one in through Prince George, a much calmer day. As far as those winds go, minus one in through Cranbrook and Prince Rupert and Haida Gwaii. That is sunshine in your forecast. After a brutal two weeks, happy to report you've got high pressure uh, bringing you a well-deserved break. A quick look at the upper atmosphere. So the uh, the richer, the purples uh, heading towards lighter pinks. Those are the colder temperatures. This is a snapshot of the upper level of the atmosphere. So uh, this is not the minus 40 we're going to get on the ground. But watch that uh, Arctic air mass shift westward as we head into Saturday. We're seeing those pinks sneak across the province. Those are the minus double digit temperatures. And yes, uh, starting to see them snake down in through parts of the south coast, a modified Arctic air mass. Uh, so we'll see that cool down Friday night into Saturday, just when we get the sun. Watching Saturday night into Sunday for, yes, accumulating snow at sea level. I will keep you posted, and I'll be watching for reports uh, from the ground. Speaking of reports, getting some great ones from Prince Rupert today. And I spoke to the creator of a Facebook group for the BC Interior, uh, talking about how important these reports and having weather reporters on the ground really are. Take a listen. They say that British Columbia is a land of a thousand microclimates. There's nothing a meteorologist must hate more than when you have some guy who's sitting up in the mountains and he's saying, like, I feel the weather, man. But, uh, no. <laughs> but I mean, I that is that. true. But seriously, not true. It's hard to forecast for a thousand microclimates every day. Enter Joey only. 
the creator of the Interior Weather and Wilderness Watchers, a Facebook group he created six years ago that has grown to a community of almost 7,000 followers and contributors. Joey first became terrified by weather after he was struck by lightning at the age of five. By the time he was struck by lightning a second time at age 20, yep, you heard that right, Joey had caught the weather bug. Sure, it's self-taught, but I spend time watching university-level lectures on YouTube and whatnot and talking to people like you trying to get the, the, the real scoop. Talk about what you know. So, I mean, I've, I've been on the land my whole life. It's kind of this only child thing where I, you know, my friend was the forest, so I, I spent time in it. And, and I have things I've learned and want to communicate and, and speak about what you know. I think I decided to take it to this next level of, of doing more YouTube and more video because uh, there's such a need for it. That's when he started this Facebook group where members actively post reports, questions, pictures, and forecast daily. More if there's active weather. There's a need for, for reporting here in the, the Caribou and Prince George areas. You have a lot of people who live up here and when they turn the TV on, there's just not really often something being said to them directly about what to expect in their backyard. And where are they posting from? Probably going to have snow in Wells, Barkerville, Horsefly, Hicks, and Alexandria, Skeech, Blackwater, Quinell, McLeese, PG, Stoner, Red Rock, Bear Lake, Anaheim Lake, Williams Lake, Green Lake, Adams Lake, Elkley Lake, Moberly Lake, Monty Lake, Bushy Lake, Nimple Lake, Christina Lake, Deese Lake, Beaver, D Francois Lake, stuff. There's a lot of places here called Lake, man. That was the world famous Frankie McDonald he was chatting with, by the way, YouTube forecaster from the East Coast. I have the privilege of forecasting the weather for British Columbia, but I don't have the capacity to hone in on every microclimate. But day to day, as is the case for life in general for the BC interior, people help each other out. And that can be a snow report, an interesting article on the season ahead, or thoughts on an impending storm. And in turn, those reports really help us meteorologists out. The more verification we can get on an event, when did the rain start, how much snow, was there flooding, the better our forecast will get, and the better our micro forecast will get. And there's a lot of people who work in the bush every day and they just, you know, they just want to know, like, what's, what's it going to be like out there today? And, hey, Joey's saying, you know, if you start hearing, uh, seeing dark clouds at three this afternoon, you know, there's going to be and sure enough, by 11 o'clock, they're out of touch with the world, but then Environment Canada's throwing up their weather warnings and weather watches, and they didn't get to see that. All they saw was me blabbing as if I know something. So thank you for sharing my passion, and keep those weather reports coming, and we will continue to learn from each other. And now, your sign. Discouraged. Discouraged by a lack of on-ice diversity, this Montreal figure skater has taken his message online. He's racked up quite the following, the smooth sliding steps of a dodgeball day, next. Thanks, Don. There were 481 rat reports last year. Out of those, only 26 were confirmed as the real deal. About half turned out to be muskrats. Karen Wickerson is the province's rat and pest program specialist. She can pick out the difference. If they're out in the middle of the road, walking down the street, I can tell that they waddle um, as opposed to a rat that scurries. So, and, and just the size, and they have a distinctive kind of hump on their back, so, so it is. You, you learn you learn fairly quickly how to identify them. In April, the province launched another way to report rats via email, which could account for the jump in sightings. Our biggest threat of rats coming into the province now is on vehicles from that come in from out of province, whether it be transport trucks or private citizen vehicles. Albertans could be noticing more rodents because of the pandemic too. Researcher Kaylee Briers with the Vancouver Rat Project says mass changes in human behavior should trickle down into the rat world, but it's hard to see how the pandemic is playing out for these pests. One of the difficult things is it's all sort of anecdotal, so we don't have any um, hard evidence to say how rat behavior has changed. Wickerson says there may be awareness campaigns coming to help Albertans better distinguish between rats and other rodents. Helen Pike, CBC News, Airdrie. There's nothing better than a home-cooked meal, unless, of course, it's prepared by a well-known chef. 
Ben Kramer, whose food has been served at swanky dining events like Raw Almond and Table for 1200, is now helping make sure anyone can access a high quality meal. It's kind of the foundation for people um, to feel safe and to feel secure and to feel kind of loved. Last May, Community Food Centers Canada launched a program called Made with Love. It paired local chefs with frontline organizations to create meals for people living in low-income communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Initially, it was emergency triage for people who desperately needed food and couldn't access it. A lot of the, uh, the food banks and the missions were shut down when the pandemic first hit. Donations sort of dried up a little bit. Before the pandemic, Norwest offered four sit-down meals a week. It's since switched to a takeout model and uses the Made with Love packages to help keep up with demand. Pre-pandemic, we were doing approximately 85 meals per service. And we've now gone up to anywhere from 150 to 200 meals per service. The program was only intended to run for a few weeks, but donations from the community allowed Kramer to keep going. As the need grew, so did our desire to help. Kramer said as long as donations keep coming in, he'll keep cooking. Paula Carrick, CBC News, Winnipeg. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC is proud to sponsor the 27th annual online Victoria Film Festival, Vancouver Island's largest and longest running film fest. Get your tickets today at victoriafilmfestival.com. And never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. A Montreal figure skater has turned his passion into a mission, discouraged by the lack of diversity on the ice. Mm -hmm. He decided to take action to make the sport more inclusive. And as Chloe Rinaldi reports, other BIPOC athletes are hoping it will lead to more changes in their sport as well. Elage <laughs> Balde spent years training as a competitive figure skater, but he never felt like he belonged. So he swirled into a different direction as an artistic skater. Well, you know, figure skating is not the most diverse sport. Um, I grew up um, with obviously a lack of representation in terms of people that looked like me. Balde says it was difficult for him to fit in in a sport that was predominantly white. So I started changing the way I looked, the way I talked, the way I walked, the way I dressed, what music I skated to. Um, I tried to fit that, you know, um, that kind of like white European um, look and style. And Balde says really class authentic. and race became a barrier for many in the sport. So to help other BIPOC athletes, he co-founded Figure Skating Diversity and Inclusion Alliance. We wanted to start the conversation within the figure skating community on systemic oppression and diversity and lack thereof. There are other sports facing the same problem. Mateo Peru Short says he's experienced racism in rinks and hockey tournaments. Well, when I look around my bench, I'm and I see the coaches and everybody is white, then I feel out of place and I feel uncomfortable and I just feel very um, hurt by that. The 13-year-old started hockey when he was four. His mother worried about him at the time. I have to ask myself, do I want to put my child in another situation where he's likely to face racism because he's probably going to be one of the only uh, black players on the bench? Um, so I had to weigh all of that with allowing my child to live out his passion. Mateo joined the Black Hockey family, a group where players come together to support one another. He loves it. They let me in like I was family and we talk every day. We talk about our problems. That's the goal, to make more people feel like they belong on the ice. Chloe Rinaldi, CBC News, for Done. Before we go, a bit of breaking news to share with you. Some BC cities are considering the possibility of regulating cats outdoors. Oh I could boy, keep going, Mike. You could, really. As Justin McElroy explains, counselors are looking at putting felines on a tighter leash. Are the days of free roaming outdoor cats coming to an end? In Nanaimo, BC, they might be. The municipality will be voting on regulating cats outdoors and not allowing them to roam free. 
Banning outdoor cats would bring bylaws in line with those that already exist for dogs. Most BC cities don't have cat-specific bylaws, but one Richmond councillor says it's important. The problem is when they're outdoors given free reign to wreak havoc on the neighbourhood. I've seen countless numbers uh, of times, even in the last uh, month, where cats had wild birds in their mouth as they're running across uh, the yard. Despite the increased interest, there is no guarantee of anything in Richmond other than a possible educational campaign, so no need to rush out to buy a cat leash right now. Free reign to wreak havoc on our neighborhoods. <laughs> this is a Justin story, and for that, uh, I thank him. <laughs> it's genius. I don't know how the cats yeah. really feel about having, having a leash. Dogs, of course, uh, yeah. But yes. I've seen them in strollers. Uh, I think they prefer a stroller life. There you go. There you go. All right, that's it for us tonight. Uh, Dan is here at 11 o'clock right after the National. Thanks for watching. Have a great night. Good night, meow.